study is in the third chapter of Jeremiah. Um, and the chapter begins with kind of a provocative thought. Um, uh, he says, Jeremiah says, they say, if a man paid it, put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's wife, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Now, uh, under the law of Moses, under uh, the Old Testament regime, uh, if a person, a uh, couple divorced, um, the uh, man that was divorced couldn't have later on uh, you know, marry his that wife if she'd be married to another. Now, kind of simple. Um, but then, God divorced ancient Israel, sent them away into captivity. That is ancient Israel. That is the ten tribes of Israel. Um, sent them away. Now, it looks like He's saying here, contrary to that law of divorce, um, under certain conditions, you could come back. Now, how can the justice of God be complete or fulfilled with that arrangement? A man who was divorced, the wife, the wife uh, married another one. A man couldn't marry her again uh, God however says to Israel you can come back uh -huh. pardon me why he, he made them a promise with conditions so how is the justice of, of, justice of God fulfilled in, in, in that arrangement. Oh. Now, Jeremiah, first part of Jeremiah 3, and, and much of Jeremiah 3 had to do with repentance. It's kind of the theme that runs through that. Now, uh, when God divorced Israel, could the whole nation come back? Under what con no. under what conditions could they come back? And Carolyn mentioned it. It was the, the attitude of, and we'll see the confession, confessing their wrongdoings, repenting. Well, you know, all of them are going to, so the answer is could they come back? Maybe, but we don't know. Could they know? Yeah. Because of their own influence. So, the bottom line of all this is that the nation wasn't going to come back, didn't come back, but there were those that could come back and history would indicate that some of the people of ancient Israel, that is the, tw the, the ten tribes, some of those people came back to Jerusalem along with the southern tribes, some the s several thousand of the southern tribe that came back from Babylonian captivity. So um, this this shows the the, the, the long suffering of God. It shows that if if in fact people repent, uh, acknowledge their wrongdoings, and He will accept them. It's a marvel to me that Manasseh, who was literally one of the worst Hitler-type people, uh, 
kings of the Old Testament that he was carried away into temporary captivity, he came back and, and, and God blessed him when he came back. I, I, it's just hard to fathom that a rascal like that. Now, let's, let's, the, worst, the worst character I, you know, in, in the last 500 years, the worst, probably the worst character, one of the worst, at least one of the worst characters that, that ever lived on the face of the earth was Hitler. Now, think about this. Suppose Hitler genuinely repented. Genuine, you know, could, could God have accepted him? Well, could he? And that, you know, isn't that something? Person that that horrible. Well, um, so he, let me read that verse again, and then the second one as well. They say if a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's, um, shall he return unto her again? Um, shall not the land be greatly polluted, if, if that happened? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet returned unto me, saith the Lord. When, when, when he talks about, when he mentions here that thou hast played the harlot, with many lovers. Now there's a there's a physical and a spiritual application to that. See that veil worship was all about sex, illicit sex, whoredom. So they were involved in when they were involved with veil worship, they were involved in physical uh, uh, whoredom. And they were also involved in spiritual whoredom because they left God's um, religion, God's um, covenant for a covenant with, with these, these um, um, you know, the, 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 the Baal worship. Now then he says in, in verse 2, lift up thine eyes into the high places. Now he, he's saying here, you know, look around. He says, look around. Um, see, see where thou hast been lain with. Using that physical relationship, you see. So see who you've been um, messing around with. Well, in, uh, you know, they, they, they had groves of trees. They had idols here and there. They, they had, you know, it was just all over the place. There was a section of Jerusalem that was, you know, that was, that was uh, during Solomon's period, he set up idols, he set up worship places for his wives uh, in, in, you know, in, in, in an area of Jerusalem. Well, uh, he says, you, you look around, um, you know, view yourself, do some introspection. Um, he says there, in the ways thou hast sat for them um, as the Arabian, or as some versions say as the Arabs, in the wilderness, um, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Now when he invokes that idea, the, the Arab, um, these Arabians uh, uh, out in the deserts, out in the deserts, They'd wait for somebody and pounce on them. They were highway robbers, right? Um, th that's that's how they lived. And and he's saying that that he's saying to the Jewish people, he says, that's the way you guys are. That's the way you Jews are. You just pounce on those idols. You just run to those idols. You're attracted. It's a magnetism for you. You're in. That's the way you, that's the way you've been. Um, and you've polluted the land. God allowed the Jews to destroy the, the people of Canaan, the Palestine area. He allowed them to destroy them and run them out because of the, the whoredoms that they, because of the idolatry. 
And now here, they're fully engaged. They fully embraced idolatry. Northern Israel fully embraced um, um, Baal. Uh, in fact, the uh, Ahab, the king of, of, of northern Israel, Ahab, the king, married Jezebel, who was an idolater, and uh, she um, helped to just completely take the whole population to, to idolatry. Well, God must have known when he gave the, gave the Ten Commandments, <laughs> when he said, Don't, you, you, thou shalt have no other gods before, you know, uh, that, that you can't worship idols, you know. God, God must have known that there, that there would be a tendency for some of his people to go off into that, that, that kind of a lifestyle. Well, he, they, he, <laughs> they should have known who he he was. He was the God that take that got them out of Egypt, the God that got him across the, the Red Sea. Yeah. Well, that's um kind of comes out today as, as it did with the Jews in the long ago. Now therefore, you know, therefore the showers have been withholding. Now, you recall Elijah um, told Ahab the king not going to reign for th uh, three, and three years. Now, didn't rain for three years. But when he had that encounter, when Elijah had that encounter with the 450 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, and all of us know what happened there, uh, the um, Baal worshipers couldn't produce any, any effects. Uh, God of heaven consumed the sacrifice and licked up not only the water around the sacrifice, but also the stones that were used to, to contain the sacrifice. And uh, the 450 prophets of Baal were destroyed. And then what happened? It rained. Okay. Now, that was kind of, that was a slap in the face to Baal because there was a belief the Baal worship, there was a belief that, um, that he was the god of fertility uh, for, you know, the production of crops. And, and of course, the fact that, w that God withheld the rain was a slap in the face to, to um, uh, Baal, uh, to use uh, the terminology here we heard earlier. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, Don points out, every, Reminds us that um, when that contest with the prophet of God uh, and um, the Baal worshippers couldn't get any results, um, he says, "You know, why don't you yell a little louder? Maybe they, maybe Baal's asleep. Maybe your God's asleep or something." Therefore, the showers have been withholding, and there hath been no latter rain. It hadn't been raining, and thou hast a whore's forehead. Thou refusest to be a, a sh ashamed. Now, thou hast a whore's forehead. Thou refusest to be ashamed. What kind of language is that? Hey, huh? Yeah. Yeah. He says. You've got a, you've got a, 
You're as brazen as a harlot with no shame. With no shame connected with you. You're brazen. You are just uh, uh, no, no shame whatsoever. Well, that's just an expression. Kind of a brazen forehead. No, no, uh, just, uh, it's just, it's, it's a, I guess in a sense, a facial expression. Uh, a hardened, it's a hardened, yeah, uh, Bill says the way of thinking. It's a hardened resistance to any, anything that's good and, and appropriate. Um, you're, you're just like, you just have the attitude of a whore. Now, that's pretty straightforward language. No shame. You're brazen. You know. Well, um, wilt thou not from this time cry unto me, my father, thou art the guide of my youth? Now, there, there's a question of what, what, what that means. Um, it, it could mean, um, will, will, will you in that, in that brazen condition, that bad attitude, that negative attitude toward God, will you rather flippantly say to me, our Father, who art in heaven, so to speak, um, kind of like a, a mafia figure who would go to church and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, you know. That that could reference the attitude, you, you know, that, that, that could be one meaning of this. But wilt thou not from this time cry unto me? Now, maybe God is saying to these people, won't you return to me sincerely, penitently, and say, you know, address me as Father in heaven? Could it could I don't know what I don't know what I don't know which way that that turns. Um, will he reserve his anger forever? Now. It, it may be the latter. Maybe he's saying, return to me as your father and my anger may subside. Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldest. Um, he... It, now that's interesting language there. Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldest. What's he saying there? You were as bad as you could be. Another, another, another way of thinking about it, you couldn't have been any worse. You were just so bad that you couldn't have been any worse been as bad as you could be or bad as you were able to be as bad as you had the capacity to be you couldn't have been any worse and, and he's, he's reminding them that uh, and then he kind of closes that the, the, Jeremiah kind of closes that you know there with you've been as bad as you could be and then he says the Lord also said unto me now here, Jeremiah is continuing to receive these messages from God, whether it be in a vision, whether it be direct words, we don't know. But, but uh, God communicated with, with, uh, um, the, with Jeremiah, uh, and it was in the, in the days of Josiah the king. Now, let's recall. Josiah, good king, bad king? Good king. In fact, cleansed the temple. 
they even found the Ark of the Covenant. Uncovered the Ark of the Covenant, which had been kind of lost from memory. What was the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark that contained what? The, 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 the tablets, the, the Ten Commandments, the, the, the stone can, uh, can commandments, you know, the, the stone on which the commandments were... And, and, and that indicated what? The ark indicated what? The presence, the presence of God. And it was in the Holy of Holies. The Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy of Holies. And, and, the, and the, it, was, it was his presence that, that was his presence was there so much so that only the high priest could go into that place how often? Once a year. So this Ark of the Covenant was, was discovered during Josiah's reign. So here, the Lord also said unto me, in the days of Josiah, now, Jeremiah probably had some pretty good years during the uh, time of Josiah because he would have had the protection of the king. Um, because of Joh they were on the same page, uh, so to speak. Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel has done. Um, now, during the days of Josiah, that was during, and Josiah was the king of Judah, based at Jerusalem. And he's saying here, um, Hast thou seen what backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up unto every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. Now, he's talking here about Israel, talking about the northern tribes. Now, what had happened to the northern tribes by the time that, that Jeremiah came along and Josiah was king? The northern tribes had been already carried away into Assyrian captivity. Okay? Now, he's reasoning with them. He says, now, uh, hast thou seen, he's saying to the Judas, people you have you have you seen do you know what's history tell us uh, you know hast thou seen what backsliding yours will have done she has gone upon every high mountain and under every green tree and there has played the harlot well Israel um, now Isaiah at the time that um, northern Israel was carried away into Assyrian captivity um, he, he warned Judah that, you know, the same thing could happen to them. And as it turned out, it did happen to them because they didn't learn from what happened to Israel or northern Israel. Um, in verse 7, And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me, and she returned not. Why did, why did God send... Elijah and Elisha and other prophets to northern Israel when they were completely engrossed in idolatry. Why did he send those prophets? Yeah, I mean, it was the, the idea here is that he, you know, he was, these prophets were saying, you know, turn and go back to God. And, but uh, northern Israel, the northern tribes, they didn't return. But she returned not. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Now here's Judah, the people of Judah, the Ju people of Jerusalem. They saw what happened to northern Israel. They knew that northern Israel was an idolatrous nation. They'd left God, and they were, carrying, they were carried away, away into captivity. Now, at the same time, that Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, took away northern, the, the northern tribes, what did he do with regard to Jerusalem? His army surrounded Jerusalem, do you recall, from a study of Isaiah? The northern, uh, the Assyrians came against Judah. And we've said this a number of times. God intercepted 
when he took out 185,000 of the army of Sennacherib, the army of Assyria, took them out dead. And then the Assyrians went home and Judah remained for another 100 years or so. And the people of Judah understood. They saw that what happened to um, nor northern Israel and they knew why it happened because of their idolatry. They, God punished them. But then, did, did Judah learn a lesson? Did this, <laughs> did this cause Judah to, to walk the straight and narrow? Well, um, verse... Um, go. No, go. But you got to remember, Nikki, old Jezebel was a woman. <laughs> Jezebel was pulling Ahab's strings, right? And if you know if you know anything about women in a marriage situation, they're typically they're typically pulling the strings. Okay? What? <laughs> well, bottom, the bottom line is the women were just as corrupt as the men. That, that we, can, we, we just would know that they're just as corrupt as the men. And, they're, and in the case of Jezebel, she was egging him on. It was old Jezebel that caused Ahab to kill him. Nabob to get his property, you know? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, verse 8, and I saw when for all these causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away, you know, Judah saw that, and given her a bill of divorce got rid of them, yet the treacherous sister Judah feared not. She didn't learn anything from what happened to the other sister, that is, the, the other tribes of Israel. And so she played the harlot. That's not only spiritual harlotry, but physical harlotry with the Baal worship. And it came to pass um, through the lightness of her whoredoms, that is the, you know, it was just the easily accepted whoredom. It was just, the, it just kind of came natural to them. What? Yeah. Um, that, that, she, that she defiled the land and committed adultery with the stones and sticks. The stones and sticks there, we've run, we've run on to that previously in Jeremiah, Symbols of the, the Baal um, worship. Uh, stone pillars having to do with the male side of it and uh, these uh, trees, the female side of it. In verse 10, And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but vainly saith the Lord. That is, in kind of a false pretense or a false manner. Now, he may have been talking about, you know, during the time of Josiah, since Josiah the king was promoting the law of Moses, since he was promoting going back to the temple worship, since he was promoting um, righteousness according to the law of Moses, I suppose some of the people you know, kind of acted like they were righteous, right? You see, 
you know, the king, whether you like it or not, the king or the president or the leaders have influence on the social order, right? Their behavior affects the social order. Is that right? Okay. So uh, some of these people probably may have been, well, you know, the king says we ought to do the temple thing. Eh, well, let's go up to the temple. But they weren't sincere about it, see. They, they weren't really converted and con committed. And there was probably more fear back then to follow the political leaders. You might think, well, I'm not going to kill them. Yeah, that, were, that too. Because you, you get, get crossways of the king, you might lose your head. Um, that, you know, that too. Um, so, um, then in verse 11, the Lord said to me, now here, here again, you know, it's off just every whip stitch, um, the, um, this language, the Lord said to me. So, so Jeremiah is getting a, a new message here. And the Lord said to me, the backsliding Israel has justified herself more than the treacherous Judah. How, how could that be? How could, how could northern Israel be better than Judah? How could that be? Pardon me? Yeah. Judah had more enlightenment on the situation. And the greater the, the enlightenment, the greater the, re, the responsibility. Um, the greater, you know, knowledge of God, the greater responsibility. And, and so God is saying through Jeremiah, you know, you people in, Ju in Judah, you're worse than the, the, the people that the got carried away into captivity. Uh, you, you're, um, the Lord said to me, the backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Now then, God says to Jeremiah, you go and you proclaim these words to the north. Now, where were the people of the northern tribes of Israel? They were to the north. And so he, it was, you know, symbolically, you go and proclaim to the north, face north, north, so to speak, and proclaim, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. Okay. He's saying to those folks, you come back. And I will not cause my anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful. God is merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Well, now that's good news, right? But is that, are there any conditions that, that, that relate to that? Is that conditional? Well, <laughs> verse 13 says, only acknowledge if thine, it, no, acknowledge thine iniquities. Now, now, in other words, because the condition is you acknowledge the iniquity. You acknowledge that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God. You've got to acknowledge that you're a sin, you know, that you were engaged in corruption, sin, debauchery, and has scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree. These places of worship, these, these, idol, these idols were all over the place, um, just under every green tree, so to speak. It says under every green tree. They had idols here everywhere, scattered. And then the, these, the, these people of Judah flocked to those, those places of idolatry. And ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. So acknowledge that. And then, then he says, verse 14, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married to you. No. How about that? 
I thought when, you know, under the Old Testament, divorce, somebody marries another one, man can't take that wife back. Um, he didn't bring back the whole nation of Israel, but those that uh, acknowledged and, and turned um, uh, would, would he, he says he would take them back. I will take you one. Now he says, I'll take you one of a city and two of a family. Now that's the interesting language. One of a city, two of, two of a family. When, when, when um, numbers like that are used in scripture, it, it oftentimes relates to, it, it kind of identifies, um, you know, um, intensity. Um, it, it identifies a progression. So he says, I'll take you back. I'll really take you back if, you know, those conditions are, are followed. I will bring you to Zion. Now, I'll bring you to Zion. There are two fulfillments here. One, he brought them back to Jerusalem, and some of those people of the northern tribes came back to Jerusalem and became a body, part of the body of the Jewish people um, that, that lasted you know, the nation lasted until the time of Christ, obviously, as a, as a nation. But then there's a, another fulfillment here in that language, I'll bring you back to Zion. And that's the, the really important fulfillment had to do with the Christian era. Um, I will give you pastors according to my heart. Now, when, when, they, when they came back from Babylonian captivity, when, they, when Judah came back from Bab Babylonian captivity, a remnant, a few of them came back. He gave them leaders. Who were some of the leaders that, that um, t helped restore the temple? help restore the walls of Jerusalem, help restore the, the, the practice of the Old Testament law of Moses. Who were some of those leaders? Ezra. Who else? Nehemiah. However, this has its primary fulfillment in, in the, the New Testament. Um, he says, when he says, um, I will give you uh, pastors and teachers. Um, who is he referring to there? Let's, let's, while you're thinking about that, let's just reread that. In verse 15, I'll give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Now, who were the pastors and teachers at the time of Christ? The primary pastors were uh, pastors being teachers, being overseers. Who were the primary? The apostles. Um, and, and to be an apostle, you had to be what? You had to be a witness. You, could, you couldn't be an apostle without being a witness. And, and of course, um, Paul was an apostle because he was a witness on the road to Damascus, right? So uh, these God in, 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 his, in the scheme of things, God has set up this arrangement where Christ had 12 apostles. And there they, they were the witnesses of, of this whole matter. They, they were the path, they were the the teachers, um, when when um, when um, at the when when Jesus ascended into heaven, ascended into heaven, and she he had the the eleven. Judas was out of the picture by that time. When he had the eleven gathered around him, uh, he said to go 
into Jerusalem and do what? Wait till you be endued with power from on high. Uh, and and we, we saw that play out when, when on the day of Pentecost. Well, uh, from that point on, from Pentecost on, um, the apostles were kind of the purveyors of, of the Christian ethic throughout the world. And, uh, and of course, they passed on um, the, the, you know, the they passed on the, 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 the uh, power of the Spirit to others, but they were the primary. Um, they, they were the primary engines for this this whole movement, this whole church movement, um, gospel movement. So uh, I'll give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall heal or feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increase in the land. Now, multiplied and increase in the land. In those days, now when, when the Bible talks about those days, it's typically it's talking about the New Testament era. In those days, saith the Lord, and they shall no more, and they shall say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done anymore. What's he saying about the Ark of the Covenant here? The Ark of the Covenant was the center of the Jewish religion. That was designated the, the, the presence of God. Now, is there any need for an Ark of the Covenant in the New Testament era? Obviously not. Why? As Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, finish that. There I'll be also. And so his presence doesn't depend now on an Ark.